afternoon, everyone. We're going to get started. Uh, first, thank you very much for coming out this afternoon. Uh, please turn off your cell phones. Everything is being recorded so that you can come back or a friend who couldn't come here today can come to the museum and hear this talk. So remember that if you go to have whispered conversations because they will, uh, you can hear them on the recorder. <laughs> so, um, we want to thank Vincent Turner today. Uh, Vincent has been with the Bayside History Museum for three years. He walked in three years ago to volunteer and we put him to work and he's been working with us ever since. He goes to St. Mary's College, and this is a presentation on one of his college projects that he had done about Pirate Radio. We also want to acknowledge our sponsors and thank the Calvert Library and the Bayside History Museum today for making this presentation possible. Uh, the microphone is not working, but the good news is the PowerPoint is. So if you can't hear Vincent, put your hand up. He talks as loud as I do, so I think you're going to be fine. And again, thank you for coming. Enjoy the presentation. Vincent? So all my slides are on a black background to make it a little easier to see the pictures because they're all black and white. So if you're probably reading around about it. Uh, to give you some uh, background to this, during the 1950s in can you hear me a little louder? Yeah, is this good? Do I need to talk? Is this project? Project? Yeah. All right. This level? A little yeah. higher? A little lower? That's good. This level? All right. So 1950s in England, they came up with this music style known as skiffle, which was a mixture between uh, rock and roll and old country and uh, R&B. And they wanted it played on the air. But the British Broadcasting Corporation in its 1927 charter said that they had um, all of the power to determine what radio stations could and could not play. And they didn't want to play pop music. They wanted to play swing music. But the young people wanted to listen to rock and roll and R&B and skiffle. So the uh, earliest stations uh, were the result of the BBC saying, we're not going to play what you want, and the younger generation saying, we're going to play what we want. So here we have the three, uh, the three things that the pirate radio stations, uh, the pirates wanted. They wanted to play, <laughs> sorry, this is my first presentation. <laughs> they wanted to play the music that they wanted. They wanted to play when they wanted. And many stations broadcast 24 hours a day. And some had a few breaks here. Uh, radio Caroline had a two hour break when they first started, so that we had another pirate radio station to play. So there's a little bit of courtesy going in between these different stations. They also wanted to play the music how they wanted to, which was in uh, top charts. They had, uh, they actually started copying from America the top 40 charts. Because in England, they basically just played music on the air. You know, it was just swing music. They'd play whatever they wanted. Well, they decided they would listen to their listeners. And the listeners wanted to hear you know, top songs, and they wanted to hear this over that. And they based all of their radio programs off of what their listeners wanted to, rather than the other way around. So these are the predecessor pirate ships. And I want to take a little bit of time here to discuss what you're seeing here, because it may look a little confusing. So we have the first pirate radio station ever, Radio Luxembourg, which uh, broadcast <coughs> all over Northern Europe starting in 1933. And that angered a lot of governments because they said, you can't, pl you can't broadcast you know, uh, music and programs and stuff in our country. We're in control of our country. Well, Luxembourg decided they didn't care and just kept broadcasting you know, wherever they wanted to, you know, what they wanted to. They actually broadcast to England between 6 and 8 p.m. every single day. And that really frustrated the British government, but they couldn't do anything because they didn't want to start a war over a radio station. Now, the first official pirate radio ship was the United States Coast Guard Cutter Courier. It was installed with the... Uh, the most powerful radio transmitter ever. It had a generator on board that generated one and a half million kilowatts of power, which, I mean, it's insane. They actually, their range, when they, their first broadcast was in Washington, D.C., and they broadcast to Moscow in 1952. 
And that was just to show the Russians they could do it. So they primarily played Voice of America, which was a bit of American propaganda stuff. And it's, the reason they decided to do it on a ship was they could move it to right off the coast of Russia or another communist country broadcast. And by the time they responded, they could move the ship back into international waters and the Russians couldn't do anything about it. Now, as you can see here, this little balloon up here at the top, this is their radio aerial. They had a wire that ran from the ship all the way up here, 900 feet, so they could broadcast. Mm -hmm. They had a few issues in the beginning where the, uh, the rope would snap and it'd float off, and there's $18,000 gone. So they came up with reinforced cables. Uh, unfortunately, you know, it's a very, you know, it's not a very uh, precarious. It's clergy, right? You can't play it when there's storms going. You can't play it on rough seas. You can't, you know, sometimes there's atmospheric interference. There's airplanes that'll buzz you. So it wasn't a very effective system. They stopped in 1964 because they decided that, you know, we can just broadcast from land for the same thing. So then you had the first radio pirate ships. So if you'll notice, they have a little bit of funny spelling up there. They're all Dutch and they would broadcast to the Dutch mainland. Now this is where the English pirates got their ideas from. So they saw Radio Veronica, which was the first one to start with the music programs and uh, play their own pop music. And they decided that we could do the same thing but in English for us. So these are some of the first pirates. Now, Everyone up here, except for Ronan O'Rahili and Alan Crawford, were pirate DJs. Ronan O'Rahili was a music producer for Georgie Fame, and he couldn't get anybody to play Georgie's music in England. So he decided he'd make his own radio station just in spite of BBC. So he got together a bunch of DJs, he got together, he bought a ship, he outfitted it, and in 1964 he broadcast the first pirate uh, music on the air. And it, needless to say, it really worked the British government that they were doing this. So um, we have Alan Crawford, who was an American, and he came over to do the same thing that Ronan was, only he had never heard of Ronan. He was doing this of his own ideas. But when he heard Ronan broadcasting in April of, uh, 1964, he panicked and rushed his ship out three miles away and started broadcasting as well to draw some of the attention. But all of these DJs I picked are because they started out in 1964, and the BBC would eventually hire every single one of these to do their own programs because they were so successful and had such a dedicated audience, the BBC figured they could cash in on this free entertainment. So these are some of the pirate stations all the way up until 1968. You have the first one up there, Radio Luxembourg, going down to the first Radio Caroline, which was the first of the Golden Age Pirates. And you have Radio Atlanta, which was Alan Crawford's creation. And eventually, Radio Caroline and Atlanta would merge together to form Radio Caroline North and South. Radio uh, Caroline North would go to Scotland and play off of there, while Radio uh, Caroline South would stay right off of London and play to their biggest audience. You also had uh, Radio London, you know, change the names around every now and then to keep the authorities off because they had, they had headquarters in London, which would get raided frequently. So if you keep changing the name, then you have to have a new warrant to search the place. <laughs> <laughs> now, a really interesting case is Swing Radio England over here in 1966. Now, it supposedly just played really fast-paced swing music and pop music. But there was also implications that the CIA was funding them to broadcast messages in the downtime and in between in airs. Now, there's no official documentation on it. It's just two of the DJs were saying, well, the CIA approached us in 66 to you know, broadcast propaganda to England to keep the communists and socialists from you know, being successful there. So at peak popularity, as you can see in 1966, they had 45% of the total population of England listening to them. In 1967, they had equal 25 million. And interestingly enough, they had all of these listeners, but it barely impacted the BBC. Their numbers did not decrease, which showed 
that the listeners were listening to these pirate stations, but also the BBC at the same time, which is why it took so long to take down the pirate stations, because the BBC didn't care as long as their numbers were you know, still maintained at their bottom line. These are the uh, first pirate ships of the Golden Age. You have Radio Caroline's first ship. They would eventually uh, purchase four more ships and continuously broadcast up until the 90s with the advent of the internet, and then they started doing it on the internet because it's a little harder to shut down. <laughs> now, all of these ships you can see, they don't really look like what you'd expect for a radio station. Well, all of the ships were converted from either fishing ships or cargo ships. And with the cargo ships, they had, this, uh, they had these giant holds, and they would build their radio stations in boxes and then lower them into the holds and sail the ship out. So that way when they came back to port, they could lift it out and put in new equipment. It makes it nice and easy, and you don't have to worry about constantly stripping out the ship or um, you know, things breaking down and you have to like tear your ship apart to pull the stuff out. It also made it so these guys could sail away from police boats that would come out to chase them and uh, they're, you know, of course, they're broadcasting from a location, you know, at one spot. So if they had any tips that raids were coming through, they could just move their ships out of the way and the police would arrive and see nothing but the North Sea. Now, over there, you see Cheetah, which has six different stations involved there. This was because pirate radio stations were expensive. So you, you had a frequent turnover of owners, you had a frequent turnover of DJs and everybody involved with these ships. This particular ship had its own, uh, basically they were pre-connex boxes. They're just metal crates, they put all the radio stuff inside, they lower it into the hold and they go out uh, about five miles actually from Radio Caroline, broadcast theirs, and they made it so that they could just take these radio stations out because the owner of the ship didn't uh, give out his, he didn't I apologize. He didn't give ownership of his ship to the pirate stations. So he would basically rent out his ship to these stations, which would broadcast from his ship. So another interesting feature of the pirate radio stations is the Monsell Sea Forts, which you can see right here is in the Thames Estuary right outside of London. These were built in 1942 and 1943 as anti-aircraft and anti-ship defenses of London. They were designed by a guy named Guy Monsell. They were usually equipped here. You can see a little bit of the guns here. They were equipped with two, three, uh, three and a half inch AA guns and two 40 millimeter guns. Now interestingly, when the British Army, Army and Navy abandoned these, they left the guns on the ship. They just took the breaches with them and said, well, nobody's going to use these, which wasn't exactly true, and I'll explain that story later. But these were basically designed to be floated out to your uh, anchoring points, and then you can see as this uh, diagram shows, it would sink it, and it would rest on the bottom. Now, this made a pretty good uh, base for anti-aircraft guns, but also for anchoring radio aerials, too, because it was very stable. You wouldn't have a lot of moving around, and you can see few of the stations here, you have sunk head with tower radio. Tower radio didn't last too long, it lasted about three or four months, and then they ran out of money and they just left everything there, which unfortunately happened <laughs> pretty frequently. But you also have Radio Essex, which uh, there I showed how the uh, top picture is when they had the uh, lift, which broke, and you can see it has, it has uh, fallen into the river, so they would basically have to climb off the broken uh, cable lift to get into their own station. Uh, down there at the bottom we have Tongue Sands, which was another planned station. Now unfortunately when they first laid Tongue Sands down, one of the legs broke and made it unstable, so they never manned it. Well, Radio Essex was going to go there and they got on and they noticed how it basically shifted every time a wave hit, so they abandoned it as well. It's still sitting out there like that actually. So now you have the army style forts. These forts were even better for radio stations. Because as you can see, you would have a central tower here, which would go up, and then you could anchor to the points around it, which meant that they had a 200 foot aerial. You can sort of see it in the top photo there, but that's the best quality photo I could find. 
of uh, these particular pirate stations. They also had lifts, and it looks a bit like, um, what you see, like an oil platform. So they were high above the waves, they didn't have to worry about any of those um, sorts of things. It just made it a little challenging when their winches broke and they would have to rope it up to their uh, stations. Down there at the bottom right, you can see some of the anti-aircraft guns when it was manned. And that's what was, that ring there, those uh, rings around the central had the AA guns. The one off to the back had a searchlight on it, and that was the command tower. Uh, they basically just sat on that central platform there and broadcast out from there, so there's no need to wander around to the different uh, platforms. Okay. Now, REM Island, R-E-M Island, is a unique case. This was specifically built to be a pirate radio station. It's the only one that was ever specifically built to broadcast these uh, radio stations. It was designed uh, in Ireland and was built there and actually shipped out to the North Sea. They built it like an oil platform. They, uh, they chose anchor points. They brought it out. They dropped down the uh, points. And you can see some of the construction here where they barged it out. And you can see that their uh, radio tower is a little tall, and that allowed them to broadcast over the entirety of Europe, although they really only directed it towards uh, the Danish coast because the primary backers were Danish. They did broadcast to England, but they were shut down rather uh, quickly, within actually a few months of their first broadcasting, by the Dutch government, who passed a specific law in their Congress to go out and raid the station. So they went in, they arrested all of the pirate DJs, all of the equipment, they confiscated it, and it was left abandoned for several years until the Dutch realized that they could use this as a weather platform. So they came out and occupied it for their own uses. The biggest effect that pirate radio had was on the British Broadcasting Corporation. As I mentioned earlier, their 1927 charter made it so that they had to approve of any radio stations, of anything that would be played on the air, would have to go through the uh, British Broadcasting Corporation. Now the pirates are very upset, and that's why they started playing their own music, because they didn't want to listen to authority, which I mean, that's a pretty big thing in the 60s, to not listen to authority. Now, they realized, the you know, British Broadcasting Corporation realized that they could have a much larger audience, and they could make a lot more money if they started copying these pirate DJs. So, in 1967, on September 30th, radios 1, 2, 3, and 4 began their first broadcasts. Uh, they actually have retained their same programs from 1967 all the way till today. I tried to find all of their original logos. The BBC Radio Force uh, 1967 logo is not available online. I actually sent an email to ask them about it. And they, they basically, they basically told me that it's, nobody's thought to save this kind of stuff. And this is really from uh, fans that saved some of the paperwork and they uh, scanned it in and donated it to them. So Radio 1 would play pop music. And they took a cue from the pirate radio stations by establishing their own top 40 charts, which would eventually draw from the pirate radio stations because you wouldn't have to listen to sketchy radio if you listen to you know, the official uh, radio of England, so you listen to your pop music, you listen to rock and roll, and eventually you know, it moved into punk. Although they didn't, they had a very strict uh, list of requirements in order to get your music on the air. You couldn't have swearing, you couldn't have sex references, you couldn't have drug references, you couldn't, you know, you couldn't blasphemy God. That was a big one. Your music couldn't really be sad because they didn't want to have people be depressed while listening to music. It was a lot of little arbitrary things, and it was basically just to say that we're in control of what you listen to. So this proved to be a big issue later on, uh, but it wasn't you know, large enough to detract from their audiences. Radio 2 played folk, country, jazz, and swing music. So it was a holdover from their original program which made the older executives happy, but it also kept the younger audience coming back because they could just listen to Radio 2, or Radio 1. Radio 3 played classical music, operas, and classical jazz. So this is for you know, the more elites that 
were the primary funding of the BBC early on, and it kept that whole segment of the population happy. It also prevented any radio pirates from playing classical music or jazz or opera. I'm not really sure if they wanted to do that sort of thing, but they had all sorts of radio stations afterwards. Uh, BBC Radio 4 does spoken word programs. So it's like listening to NPR, but for the British. So they would go out and they would do different uh, interviews with people. They would do uh, radio broadcasts, uh, speeches that the government made. So it's, it really is just like listening to NPR. And all four of these stations came out because of these pirate radios were drawing 25 million listeners. And the British Broadcasting Corporation decided they wanted 25 million more listeners as well. So the beginning of the end came in 1966. I'm not going to read through all this because it's actually there's actually a lot, but you can see over here on the right these news clippings that I picked out. In 1966, two radio stations were going to merge. It would be Radio City and Radio Atlanta. Now, Radio City and Radio Atlanta were losing money, so they figured if they merged together that they could draw their audiences together and hopefully turn a profit instead of fading into obscurity. There were some issues over who would end up controlling it, would Radio City DJs control it, or would Radio Atlanta? And eventually they had a falling out. Well, the owner of Radio Atlanta, his name was Oliver Smedley, he was a British Army veteran who didn't like authority, so he established his own radio uh, programs. Well, he raided Radio City, took all of their radio crystals, which are essential for radios back then, confiscated all of their equipment and brought it back to his own radio station. Now, Greg Calvert, who was the owner of Radio City, realized that his station would die if he didn't get this equipment back. So he went to go confront Oliver Smedley at his house. Nobody knows what actually happened that night, since Oliver Smedley was the only one to survive the incident. He said he acted in self-defense when uh, shooting Calvert with his shotgun and killing him instantly. Now, this actually turned into a national scandal. There was actually riots in the streets over this particular murder case because the average people believed that Oliver Smedley, because he was an, of the officer class, he was an elite, was getting away with murder of one of their own in the British uh, legal system. Now, 1960 saw a huge upsurge in uh, you know, student activism people acting against the elites, acting against rich, who they saw as basically just abusing the lower classes. So this actually turned into uh, a really large case, and many people were very upset that Smedley got off on murder charges. He just had manslaughter charges, and he was only in for around uh, four or five months. And he basically got away with killing one of the radio DJs or nothing. Well, the British Parliament had been uh, looking for a reason to get rid of pirate radio stations. When this murder occurred, this, they were, I don't want to say elated, because that's kind of wrong to say about murder, but they finally had a reason to shut down the pirate radio stations. They were becoming too dangerous. It was described as gangsterism by the British Parliament, and they decided to pass a law which would effectively curtail these pirate radio stations. They passed the Marine Broadcasting Offenses Act of 1967, which did not outlaw pirate radio. What it did was it took away their base of support. If you were a British citizen and you were caught using your ship to bring supplies out, to bring people out, to bring equipment out, your boat could be confiscated, you could be fined and thrown in jail. So most of these radio stations relied on British citizens to get them back and forth and to bring them supplies. So this effectively cut off all of their support. The radio stations all ended up folding in 1967 and 1968. Well, this had also been you know, watched by the European Council, which is the predecessor to the European Union. They had similar issues. As I mentioned earlier, the Dutch had quite a few radio pirates that were broadcasting to them. The, um, the Netherlands had issues. Germany had issues. France had issues. So they decided that they would uh, band together and they would also outlaw pirate radio stations. The, uh, 
the European uh, Council's legislation outlawed ships, aircraft, floating objects, anchored objects, and anything that could be used to broadcast a radio signal, which could come into uh, a foreign country from international waters. So this effectively just got rid of everything. You couldn't have a buoy that would broadcast your system. You couldn't have a ship. You couldn't broadcast from aircraft or helicopters or even go onto an island or um, uh, broadcast from a rock, which was actually a, kind of an interesting case where a guy went out with a radio transmitter and broadcast his own thing from a rocky outcrop off the English coast. As a minor note, the guy did it as a publicity stunt because he wanted to become famous. So um, this also allowed countries which receive those radio broadcasts to send their police out to go confiscate these radios and uh, ships. Now, if uh, most of these British you know, stations they were broadcasting to England, so England sent out their navy and their version of the Coast Guard and their police to go bring in all of these pirate stations. So you can see some of the ships being brought in there. You have tugboats pulling the ships in. And they'd be basically impounded and left to rot in the harbors. So you can see some of the radio uh, masts are sticking out of the water. Well, the governments didn't care. They wanted these stations gone, so they let the boats rot until they basically sank in these harbors. Most of these were eventually scrapped. You can see Radio Veronica is still uh, floating around in 2011. There is some movement to save it, but there's just, ships are really expensive to maintain, and there's just not enough support to actually save Radio Veronica's ship, even though it's one of the first. Uh, you see uh, REM Island being dismantled by the Dutch government. It was uh, basically, they, when they finished with the uh, weather station, they abandoned it as well, and declared it a navigation hazard. So they pulled it up and then brought it to shore and then sold it for scrap. So the only purpose-built radio station was sold at auction for scrap. Uh, several of the other ships were brought into other harbors. They ran basically from the police and the military and navy forces of Europe. And they were left to rot in various harbors around the world or resold as fishing vessels or cargo vessels and basically disappeared into oblivion. Many of these ships, they don't know where they ended up, and now a lot of them are uh, scrap hulks or just completely gone. An interesting case, we have a uh, sunk head fort. This was uh, used by Tower Radio, as I mentioned earlier, for only a couple of months before they ran out of money, and then basically had to leave. So the Royal uh, Army Corps of Engineers boarded uh, sunk head on August 21st, they planted 1,200 pounds of explosives on this station and destroyed it. All that was left were 20-foot stubs of both the legs, which were eventually cut down even further to prevent ships from running into those as well. The Monsell Sea Forts became navigation hazards after the uh, pirate radios were done because nobody thought to uh, record their locations properly and they actually had several incidences of ships running into them and then having the uh, towers fall onto the ships and sinking them. So they, they still have several of these around, but two of them were demolished, and as you can see, this one was completely blown to pieces. So pirate stations actually became popular enough that people started writing about them. This is the first song dedicated to pirate radio. I would play it for you, but the, the, the tone to it is actually pretty bad. And the, uh, the uh, group that sang it in the roaring 60s it was actually just a one-time band, and this is their only song. <laughs> so they basically did it as a joke. So uh, this actually played on the pirate radio ships because it was their story. Uh, Marmalade Records actually existed up until the uh, 70s. After. This was their first song, and they existed up until the 70s when they got bought out by another uh, records company. But as you can see, the, the, it's kind of repetitive. There's not too much to it, but I really like the first line up there. The government wants to close them down. And that's what everybody was worried about, and this was a sign of their rebellion. We're going to listen to these pirate stations. We're going to tell the government, we don't care what you want us to do. We're going to listen to what we like. I mean, listening to music 
It's, it's not like they're going out and robbing stores or throwing Molotovs into Parliament or you know, just creating chaos. They wanted to listen to their music. They wanted to listen to rock and roll music. They wanted to listen to R&B and all these different uh, music genres that the BBC just didn't want to. down there in the bottom right is Radio Jackie, which was started with three car batteries and a homemade transistor radio. <laughs> so they would string up their wire between trees and then hang up their, uh, their aerial to this wire and then broadcast from there. So it was a little more dangerous broadcasting pirate radio stations from land because the police could get you at that point. So the reason they started three car batteries and their homemade transistor was because they could hear the police sirens, pack up everything quickly, and then run off with their equipment before they could get arrested. So several other stations did this as well, and there's actually, uh, I just found a book recently that was written by one of the guys from Radio Jackie originally, and some of the excerpts from it are hilarious. He was talking about uh, one time they set up in the back of an apartment building, and they started broadcasting from there. They had lookouts posted. One of them rang, the police are coming. So they grabbed all their equipment, jumped off the second story onto the fire escape, scrambled down and took off into a back alley. The police break in. They rush up to where they think that this radio station is, and there's nothing there. <laughs> so they actually had a lot of fun. And they would take their stickers that says, I Heart Radio Jackie, and stick it up on the back of police vans and on police cruisers. <laughs> <laughs> it's basically just, you know, like, oh, you, you can try and stop us. <laughs> So, uh, in the center here we have uh, pirate radio stations. It actually became uh, licensed through the BBC. Eventually they realized that, you know, fighting these guys was just going to cost them too much money. So these are actually legitimate radio stations now in England that started out as pirate stations. Um, remember when I told you your grandma was sold for scrap? Well, the guy had second thoughts about it and decided to turn it into a restaurant. So this is now in Amsterdam as a restaurant. So you can go dine in a pirate radio station if you ever catch yourself in Europe. Uh, up here we have Sealand, which I don't know if any of you have heard of it, but it's trying to become the world's smallest recognized country. And the guy actually started out as a radio DJ for Radio Essex. He moved over to uh, Rough Sands to start his own station but he couldn't find the funding for it, so he just decided to turn it into his permanent home. This man's name is uh, Lloyd Bates, and the Bates royal family still uh, lives on Sealand to this day. You can actually go and buy your own royalty position from them and go out and visit them, but it all started with Radio Essex in uh, the 1960s. Over there on the uh, far right we have Radio Caroline. That is ship number three that they decided to buy and turn into a radio station since their first two were confiscated. They would go through two more ships, which would also get confiscated before uh, going online, like I said earlier. And then actually, they're on satellite radio now, so you can hear them around the world. So, now we're gonna play a little guessing game because the BBC banned over 200 songs throughout its career. There are a lot of more arbitrary reasons, a lot of them are stupid reasons, a lot of them you'll probably never guess, and I'm just going to be standing here smiling while you try it. So, why do you think back in the USSR was banned? Well, there's one <coughs> One would think that was the reason. Uh, actually, I knew it was set up. Right. <laughs> That's what I said. The VOAC, right? Just press the space. Hmm? You mentioned the VOAC, right? No, actually it was because of the Gulf War. There was a lot of legislation uh, passed during the Gulf War that made uh, talking about it in a negative light illegal. The BBC took uh, the uh, opportunity to ban a lot of songs that they didn't really like, but they couldn't ban outright because of just the popularity. Are you going with it? It was going on in It was going on in Canada. I was sure. That's all right. All right, so you guys know the answer for number two, right? Yeah. 
This is actually a really fun song if you've ever heard about it. He's uh, Tom Blair is uh, great. He's amazing if you ever listen to any of his song. This one's about the Boy Scout motto, and he makes the disclaimer: I was never a Boy Scout, so I can make this song and I can't get in trouble. And he just, it's it's not really making fun of them so much as just how how they try to be official. But really, there's all this other stuff that goes on in the background. And it's something to like a little, you know, little ditty, and it's just got this nice little tone to it. But I really like this song, and so that's why I put it on this list. So can... It does make drum re drum references. It talks about smoking reefers with your uh, with your Cub Scout master, and <laughs> things like that, which made it not very okay. To know the radio. All right. Does anybody remember why Brown Eyed Girl was banned? They could love in the green grass behind the stadium. Yeah. Right. <laughs> you know, an interesting fact, Brown Eyed Girl was originally named Brown Skin Girl. And it was about the interracial relationship. But no radio station would play it when it was first written. So he, Van Morrison actually changed it to uh, Brown Eyed Girl, so that way they would play it on the air. So originally it was banned because it was about interracial relationships. But then it was banned because it was about, well, it had a sexual line in it. So, I don't know if any of you have heard Charlie Brown, that song. Oh, yeah. right, so why do you think that song is banned? Lord knows. Oh, yeah. Give it all the language. Close. It's because it mentioned the word spitballs. <laughs> That's basically juvenile delinquency, but to think that only one word would keep your song from getting on here is a little ridiculous nowadays, I think. Yeah. Alright, how about Come Together by the Beatles? Drug records. advertising in drugs. Now, the BBC, actually, they had a really big issue with this. They would actually make artists go back and change some of the words in their songs so they wouldn't contain references. Uh, there's another song, it's, uh, it's called Lola, and it used to have lip, and the line used to be lips like uh, Coca-Cola, but they had to change it to Cherry Cola in order to have the broadcast on the air. So why was uh, deep, deep in the Heart of Texas band? This one you'll probably never guess. I like to know because I do that one. Exactly. Yeah. All right, does anybody have any guess why Deep in the Heart of Texas was banned? Because I hate Texas. <laughs> That's a good one. I like that one. An infection. <laughs> <laughs> now, this one I had to go search and figure out. I've, I've really had to figure out why. So it actually, this uh, stems from World War II in the uh, factories. They were worried that if they played this song, the workers would wrap their wrenches or whatever tools they had on the machinery and end up dinging them or damaging them or interrupting their work. So they banned this song so that way it wouldn't get stuck in the workers' heads. <laughs> it's a little ridiculous now. <laughs> this was their logic during World War II. We can't interrupt the war effort. All right. So, why do you think House of the Rising Sun was? Prostitution. Well, uh, yep, there you go. Because nobody really knows what it was written about, but the rumors were that it was written about a house of prostitution. So they banned it just because there was a rumor about it. It's actually down in New Orleans. Right. <laughs> How about Imagine by John Lennon? Last of me. <laughs> Actually, drug use. Oh. Oh. Can you explain that? Yes, uh, there's a line where it, uh, Imagine there's no heaven. Right, right. right. Yeah. right. Yeah. And so. We got it. <laughs> okay. Good job. All right. So, how about I'll be home for Christmas? Why was that banned by the BBC? Did the press the truth? To make the troops want to go home to stop fighting the war, to basically give up and just become sad and think about, well, I want to go home. I don't want to go, you know, fight in Europe. I don't want to fight anybody. So they banned this song so that the soldiers wouldn't be depressed. <laughs> but now we hear the song and we think of Christmas. We don't think of, oh, you know, depressing stuff. I think 
Crosby was a bad guy. He's actually on this list several times because his songs were, you know, actually popular. Okay. How about let's spend the night together? Yeah, that one's kind of a little obvious. Well, the Rolling Stones appeared on the Ed Sullivan show and sang the song. He made them change the lyrics. What do you make them change it to? Let's spend some time together. Very good. <laughs> Very good. Which means the same thing. Right. <laughs> 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 All right. Now, uh, Lily Marlene, it's a bit more pressing. Right. There's another one of those. Unless somebody else wants to take a guess. Lily Marlene is actually about being a prostitute under the lamp At least that's the inference. Yeah. Yeah. This is actually a really good song. I don't know why yeah, it is a good song. So why do you think that they uh, did that? Sexual she had a bloke named Smokey, she really loved him, but he was cokey, which is a reference to cokey. No, it was actually because he would take her down to Chinatown and then we'd ah. kick the gong around, there you which go. is opium. Right. <laughs> oh yeah, this is a good one. Why do you think they banned Monster Mash from the air? Because it was a great art smash. <laughs> This is actually a really silly reason why they're in this video. And you're all going to laugh at that one as well. Oh, look, she's doing more Because it talked about monsters like vampires <laughs> and zombies and Frankenstein, and it was too scary for the listeners. So it was banned from the air. Eventually, they repealed the ban, and they did play this on the air. But originally, it was because they it mentioned vampires and zombies and mummies and scary things. <laughs> All right, did anybody see my generation is banned? Because it's in your face. Reference to stuttering. Well, yeah, that too. <laughs> well, uh, they thought it would offend people with uh, a stutter in their voice. Even though the original artist said that's not what we were going for, it was still banned for that reason anyway. Right. Yeah, that one's a little obvious. <laughs> 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 so, uh, let's get that one right. It was more of a counter-revolutionary song than yeah. the house. Right. Then, but yeah. since it has the word suicide in it. Well, no, he's talking about my generation. Oh, my generation. Yeah. That one? Right. 15 pretty obvious. Yeah. Yeah. to the uh, Arabic League or Arabic countries. They didn't want to offend anybody and expand the war out into North Africa. So that was... Uh, no, it's not race. Well, it's not race. Like <laughs> you, right, you know what? Right, we're going to go with that one. All right, these are the uh, primary websites that I pulled most of my images from and most of the information. I actually had to go to the BBC to look up their band list, and they don't list the reasons why they banned songs. So I actually have to go back and look through the legislation. That's how I figured out how all those songs were about banned. But if you have any questions, uh, now's the time. And these are all the websites that I would recommend if you want to learn anything about Pirate Station. These are actually all written by the DJs themselves, people that work for the stations, people uh, they have a lot of their own personal albums up. They have newspaper clippings. They have songs. They have basically everything you can imagine with running stations is online now and written by the DJs and the people themselves. Yes? How come if the first one was in 1933, the next one wasn't until 1952? Why was there a 20-year gap? Well, Repeat the question, please. So, yeah, we hear so the first station, 1933, Radio Luxembourg. And then you notice that in 1952 it was uh, United States Coast Guard Cutter Courier. Well, the reason the gap was that in America, they didn't have all the, uh, they didn't have a BBC like that in America. 
So you could play whatever you wanted as long as you had radio equipment there. So there was this huge gap. But in Europe, they started passing legislation much like the uh, Charter for the BBC, which was 1927, which basically said that the governments would establish their own radio stations and their own approved radio stations, and you couldn't play anything outside of that list. Well, you know, most people listen to swing music in the 30s and 40s and jazz uh, when it came over and some R&B. So it really wasn't that big of an issue. But once they started getting into the uh, popular music, you know, like rock and roll starting uh, in the 50s, once it started coming over to Europe, the governments were worried that America was Americanizing their populations. They started banning these songs. And that's why they decided to do pirate stations was because they didn't want their songs banned. They wanted to listen to what they wanted to listen to. So Voice of America really wasn't a pirate station, but you know, it was more of an effort for the US to try and take off the Russians, which they actually succeeded. And uh, the other pirate stations basically started because they wanted to play their own music. You know, it wasn't just swing and jazz and opera. You know, things they were more boring. Yeah, I guess in the 30s and 40s, there wasn't popular over there. Right. Right. Uh, two questions. Uh, mm -hmm. One, the um, stable stations that were built by the British uh, for British defense mm -hmm. in the war, uh, and they abandoned them. They were still British property, though, and why didn't, why didn't the British government reassert itself uh, at the time that they were occupied? Most of the forms were decommissioned in 1954 and 1955, and afterwards they figured nobody would bother them, so they officially abandoned the stations. They had no legal claim over these stations, and some of them actually existed outside of their territorial waters, so they had no authority there uh, to begin with. So, uh, second, the, um, these stations were obviously operating for a profit. Uh, what type of shore infrastructure was there that uh, uh, supported that, presumably for commercials and advertising? That's what right. So the biggest uh, revenue making that these pirate stations had was commercials. So they would play commercials in between different songs or sometimes even uh, after a particular DJ. He could say whether or not he wanted to do uh, commercials in between uh, his own uh, show. So they would get advertising from, you know, like uh, just any sort of company. You could have like soap companies, TV, you know, radio. You could have music companies. You could have uh, you know, soda companies. Whoever you wanted to, because it would bring in money to the stations. On shore, they had offices set up that you could go to, and a lot of people actually wanted to become DJs. So they would flood these offices with applications. So they had to frequently move them around, and uh, also prevent the police from raiding them and seizing all of their documents, which would tell the police, this is how they operate, this is the ship they operate on, so if it comes into harbor, seize it. Um, these offices were pretty small. They're you know, probably not much larger than this room. They you know, rented out smaller buildings to keep their footprint small, because what they were doing was technically illegal, so they didn't want to leave that large footprint on land for the police to raid. That became an issue later on with the uh, stations in the 70s and the 80s, because they had to operate on that. And that's why I told you to start with three car batteries and a small transistor, was because it made it hard for them to uh, be regulated. Actually, today, they don't have an official count on how many radio stations are operating in England, but they think it's around 200 pirate stations. They still have pirate stations? They still have pirate stations. They have, like I said, they have around 200 different pirate stations all over England. And not all of them play music anymore. Some of them are political stations. So you have some that advocate. You know, there was uh, several in the 60s and 70s that advocated for you know, decolonization. There's a lot that you know, advocate against war, that advocate, uh, they advocate for poverty. They actually have several that uh, people can go to. And if they have social issues, they can bring it up on air, and people can listen into this. You know, stuff that might be uh, ignored by the larger stuff you know, like if there's you know, specific stuff related to communities, community crime, you know, a missing person, they could come to a pirate station which would play it and send it to other pirate stations to play. So maybe we could find these people a little bit faster. So this law in 1927, mm -hmm. that enabled the BBC to right. control everything, is still in effect? 
it is still in effect. The BBC has final say in what stations can come online <laughs> and what is allowed to be played in the song. The just had to drive them crazy. <laughs> right. So that was, you know, that was a large goal, too, is just to annoy these people. But yes. they have a lot less regulations now. Uh, they play, you know, I'm sure you guys have listened to some of the rap songs that come on the air. They play those sorts of songs now. So they don't really have that big of an issue with banning songs. It's more in the past, uh, that list. Uh, there's been no recent songs. I think the most recent one was like 2013 was a song because it was just, uh, they basically just said it had too many curse words in it, which is still an issue, but it's not as bad as, you know, banning Monster Mash or High uh, Generation or, or whatever. He must have had a real problem. What was his name? James somebody? And he uses some real bad language using beautiful songs. And he's British. I can't think of his last name. Well, if he's very popular, then they wouldn't ban, they don't uh, ban songs of popular people anymore either because it draws away from their audience. The world has changed. Right. Mm -hmm. That's mm -hmm. yes. Is, is the, the movie that Philip Seymour Hoffman right. produced on the uh, pirate radio, is, it, is there veracity to that story? Yeah. <clears throat> it is a complete fabricate. It was actually, I read an interview by the original pirates from Radio Caroline, mm -hmm. who were originally consulted on the movie. And the guy that directed it, he listened to the pirate stations when he was a, a young boy. So this is more his fantasy than it was how how was like on the shape. It was a lot colder, it was a lot wetter, they didn't have party, you couldn't bring girls onto the station because mm -hmm. you only had a set amount of food and space. So really it's just a, it's a nice fantasy movie. It's a good, you know, action yeah. <laughs> <laughs> You know, there's, most of the stuff in there isn't true. You know, especially jumping off the top of a radio mast. That they yeah. Yeah, right. <laughs> so, yes. Yes. It would seem that a station in, of this nature would be susceptible to the payola. Uh, problems that was had in the United States during that period of time? Were there any radio or uh, record manufacturers that, that had an influence on this? So the largest limiting factor with these pirate stations was the equipment that they could afford. Um, this was all basically done out of pocket and even with the, uh, you know, the commercials, they still, most of the time they actually ran in the red. It was, it was very hard to run a pirate radio station because they had paid for fuel for your ship you know, you had to repair that, repair the equipment, you had to pay for people, you had to pay for the food. There's all sorts of costs associated with this, and that's why a lot of stations didn't last longer than a year. Um, they actually, they did have a lot of um, problems with broadcasting things, because the range for some of their aerials weren't very, uh, it wasn't very good. They had a lot of interference in the North Sea, there's a lot of storms out there, so you couldn't broadcast. There's actually a term they came up with, and it was called a half crown day, which meant that they could only play for just a little while. It was, it was just because the storms in the area would do that. Mm -hmm. They also had uh, some issues with the Soviets trying to jam the radios. Well, that's a very expensive process to jam an entire wavelength, so it didn't last too long, but it was a little bit of an issue in the, uh, in the Cold War era. Okay. Yes. Now, I didn't. I don't remember the dates that might have answered my own question if I did, but uh, there was a uh, Radio Caroline and there was a Radio Jackie. Right. Kennedy's? Actually, yes. Radio yeah. Caroline yeah. was named after um, Caroline Kennedy. Okay. <laughs> and it was because um, Ronan had seen her picture on the cover of a magazine, and he was like, well, it's a beautiful name. I think I'll name my station after. That's actually the truth. He named it after Caroline Kennedy. And Jackie? Jackie was named after uh, yeah. Jackie okay. Kennedy. That was a different uh, pirate station. That was a different set of people, but it was the same idea. A lot of them um, were named after, you know, were just named a little bit of ridiculous things. You saw like Radio Invicta, or King, or Swing and Radio England, or, you know, the Big L. So it was just whatever the pirates wanted to name their stuff. Some were named after girls, some were named after, you know, nothing. Politicians. Some were named after them, like Radio City. You know, it's just a sort of. Although Lord Sush was actually a really fun guy, he actually became a member of Parliament after he was done with his radio days. So to really spite the uh, politicians, he became a politician himself. <laughs> okay, let's have a big hand for Vincent.
everyone for coming. And I'd be remiss, I forgot about my mayor, mm -hmm. Mayor Frazier. Mm -hmm. Former mayor of who's on our North Beach Town Council, and we could not have these presentations if it weren't for him, because I had never been able to fix that. <laughs> but thank you very much for coming, and we'll see you next September. This was our last for this winter.